So good morning or good afternoon to everyone, or wherever you are, maybe good evening. I don't know uh, the location of everyone, but uh, it's a pleasure to uh, have a growing number of participants. So we, we started only earlier at four, and now I guess we're uh, 10 more participants than that. Uh, but I am here together with my colleague, Mike, uh, to present to you uh, the uh, interprofessional education and collaborative practice development in the Philippines. Uh, I am Roy and I am a PhD student now in Leuve, but I am originally from the Philippines and my professional background is occupational therapy. Well, Mike is the same. She, he's also an occupational therapist uh, and is now a professor at the National Teachers Training Center uh, for Health Professions Education in UP Manila. We'll begin with, uh, next slide, yeah. Uh, we'll begin with first, of course, the aim of uh, this the presentation, which is threefold. The first one is to describe how IPE and collaborative practice is being established in a developing country such as the Philippines, and to discuss uh, alternative contextual approaches of IPECP implementation, and lastly, to outline plans towards uh, doing IPECP in post-pandemic Philippines. Next slide, please. So a bit of context for, uh, I'm sorry, like I said, I am seeing very familiar names uh, and faces. So most of this people will know, but for the benefit of uh, people outside from my country, uh, to give a background of the Philippines, uh, we are one of the few countries uh, that has surpassed 100 million population. So that's a, that's a quite a big for not for such a country that's not really too big. Uh, and we're composed of 7,000 islands, which in a population setting, we have large sprawling urban areas, uh, but also uh, quite remote places in uh, small islands, which is difficult to access. Uh, our location in Asia is in Southeast Asia, and it is both good, good thing and a bad thing that we are able to be a bridge toward, uh, between uh, the main, mainland Asia, including China and India, but also uh, from the other side, uh, which is the Americas. Uh, but our location, like I said, is also um, the reason why we are one of the most disaster-stricken nations in the world. See, like for myself, I have experienced it in my lifetime, earthquakes, tornado, uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, and uh, typhoons, and so on. So uh, yeah, I get, I'm, I'm sure most of us here are quite familiar with it. And uh, a lot of times uh, we live through it. Uh, and that is one, that's one important context that has to be considered when looking at um, the healthcare of the country. Healthcare delivery or the healthcare system of the country is largely an out-of-pocket ex expense for ordinary Filipinos, although there have been developments towards um, uh, universal healthcare uh, since a law has been passed back in 2019. Uh, in terms of health professions education, we have that focus on developing mostly profession-centric competencies, uh, and the, ed the education system has is generally fragmented and thus make it really complex to work in, in a situation such as a pandemic. Um, next slide. Historically, uh, we can divide the, the, the development of IPECP into three parts. So the first part would be uh, the conceptualization to capacity building. So obviously the idea of interprofessional education as formally defined, um, started around 2007 uh, with the establishment of the Community Health and Development Program of UP Manila, which is um, fortunately a, a, a still an ongoing program. And since 2012, uh, Philipp uh, Filipinos have engaged in a series of formal trainings from IPECP experts abroad. And uh, since 2015, there's been a translation of this global knowledge passed from, for this, from these trainees 
into uh, applicable knowledge that can be applied in our own settings. Then we move to uh, championing to inter, uh, through inter, inter university collaboration, which I think is, is, is really important because uh, a lot of times since it, it IPECP in our country developed from the academe, it has really been turf centered, uh, like universities doing their own things without really collaborating, which kind of defeats the purpose of IPECP. Uh, and so we're happy to say that uh, since 2018, uh, with the establishment of the Philippine Interprofessional and Collaboration uh, Network, uh, we've we've uh, hosted the uh, through the University of Santo Tomas the first uh, national conference, uh, and then in 20, 2019, there's also a, a collaborate for health conference by UP Manila. And the most recent one, which was the year where the volcano and the pandemic started, uh, uh, was the joint FIPEC or the, yeah, the Philippines and the Asia Pacific Interprofessional Education Collaboration Conference uh, hosted by De La Salle and uh, in collaboration with AUF, uh, the Angeles University Foundation and University of Santo Tomas. And lastly, uh, as we have learned and contextualized knowledge from uh, the from all over the world, uh, IPECP is now instituted as formal formal courses in several institutions. Um, uh, back in 2020, uh, UST has been offering it as an elective course for under, undergraduate rehabilitation science students, and more recently, last year. It has been a required course for undergraduate health science students at De La Salle and an elective course for graduate students at the NTTC UP Manila. Yes, my hello. Thank you. Is it my turn? Okay, so um, after providing the outline of some historical background, of course, it's not exhaustive. Um, there might be some IP initiatives that we may not be in, that was not included in the slides, but please let us know if there are others that we missed. And now we are um, in the middle of the presentation wherein we want to um, share with you some roadblocks that we have experienced when it comes to promoting, implementing, and practicing IPECP in the Philippines. First thing is really the lack of policy and directives that support IPECP. Although there have been documents that encourage um, using IPECP as one of the educational outcomes in the health human resources, this has been, um, still an emerging um, development when it comes to policy. Um, another roadblock is the culture of uh, medical hegemony or medical dominance within the healthcare system. And I think that is attributable to the power relations and power distance between and among professions or different healthcare professions. Um, another roadblock that we have identified is the privatized healthcare which may not support cost-effective team-based care because like as mentioned by Roy earlier, um, our healthcare delivery system is done in two ways. It can be uh, through the universal healthcare or through the government public funds. And another would be from private healthcare. And that needs, that is still under discussion at the moment or maybe an emerging concern that we need to deal with through IPE. And one of the other roadblocks that we have recognized is really the tendency of IPECP turfs and um, among IPECP champions within the country. Um, again, it's good to know that more and more groups, institutions, and universities are initiating IPE CP programs in their universities, but there could be this tendency of building turfs rather than really collaborating amongst and with each other. And here are some of the examples that we'd like to share with all of you 
on alternative and contextual approaches on how we do IPECT in the Philippines, despite those roadblocks. In the Philippines, we have recognized in the past years that the term IPE or IPC may not be explicit, but its practice has been demonstrated in the different dimensions of healthcare, especially during the response to COVID-19. So one example is the Bayanihan na, or in English, a spirit of civic unity and cooperation. This was initiated at the Philippine General Hospitals, wherein they set up call centers manned by physicians, health science students, nurses, and different kinds of professionals to do the triaging of people who have been infected with COVID-19. So this is an example that does not really use IPE, but it's really improving health, um, health systems and health outcomes. And uh, we have seen that um, been done in, in our country. Another example is the Kabahagi Center. Kabahagi in English is a partner. It means partner. So uh, this is an example of how telecoaching has been provided since the, during the pandemic, um, seeing a therapist or seeing um, a medical professional might not be possible because of the restrictions. So these kinds of um, initiatives or remote services were provided um, through collaborative efforts between occupational, physical, and speech therapists in a local government unit, um, specifically in Quezon City, where I am located, where I am residing. Um, another example is the Community Pantry Initiative, which was um, initiated, I think, last April 2020. And this, uh, I'm not sure if our friends from outside the Philippines are familiar with this kind of um, social movement, which was led by Miss Anna Non, the, 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 the woman on the right side of the screen. She initiated this as part of a response to the hunger and social determinants of health that are happening around us amidst the pandemic. And during that time, you have seen that um, social workers, police officers, health workers, and the community themselves are helping each other to provide free food for those who have no food. And these people who have no food can really take on whatever they need from this community pantry. And from that street called Maginhawa Street, um, Maginhawa in English means sat, sat, satisfaction <laughs> or um, uh, feeling pleased or feeling comfortable. Um, that is what it means. But in the street, after uh, this um, activity has become viral in the internet, many more communities tried to emulate and copied this kind of uh, civic and social movement. Uh, by the way, I forgot to say that um, they also were able to collaborate with farmers and people who are in the business sector to, to work on, on this activity. Another example is the Health Policy and Systems Research Project between the University of the Philippines, Manila, and the Department of Health and the Department of Science and Technology. I have been part of this project wherein we were able to train almost or more than 300 health workers around the country on health policy and systems research. We really didn't have an IPE name on it, but the actions and the demonstrations of how we did this project really is to improve health outcomes among health workers and HRH. So I think these are some examples, um, contextual examples of how we are doing IPECP in the Philippines. And I think this is my last example. Um, one thing that is unique in how we do IPE in the Philippines, apart from having IPE programs in the pre-registration courses or programs, we are also, um, we, all, we, had, uh, we have a formal course on IPE under the graduate program of UP Manila, where I am currently affiliated. Um, my students in IPE are actually professionals and teachers in health professions. 
So we think that how we approach IPE is really training the trainers. And with the low resources that we have, we have we are a developing country, we have really limited resources. I think this is an efficient way of promoting IPE because we directly teach teachers who will be teaching health science professionals for the future. So that's um, an example. And of course, sorry, I thought that was the last, but this is the last. So from that course that was initiated last year, our IPE CP course, um, I have asked one of my students who is a physician and a palliative care specialist, and she has um, produced this project from that course called the uh, Balangao or Rainbow in Warai language in our country. And uh, it's a community-based IPE program for health professionals specific for primary pediatric palliative care. And through this program or through this project, they were able to start including more professionals in their team, not just physicians and nurses. So now I heard that they're starting to hire social workers, occupational therapists, physical therapists in their team to come up with this kind of program. And that's a really good, um, really good news for, for us. So the roadmap for us as we end this session it's really to first consider and continue the local capacity building and training of IPE and IPC for students, professionals, and trainers. The second is to continue promoting a community of practice among local and global IPE CP champions. Uh, Roy and I were talking with each other and saying that we can't do this alone. We need partners from all over the world to, um, to harness their knowledge, their global knowledge, and apply it for local consumption. And that could be done through the FIPEC, the APIPEC, and Interprofessional Global. The third roadmap that we are envisioning is really to strengthen further inter-university, inter-agency, and intersectoral partnerships to further promote IPE, not only in universities, but also in healthcare practice. And lastly, engage in sustainable scholarship and translational research to co-create local IPE CP model of practice that we can all use. So if you have questions, if you want to speak with us and tell us more of your stories, please send us an email and here are our references. We have our references towards the end. I think I just, yeah. Here, here are our references. Thank you, Joanna. Turn it over to you. Thank you, Roy and Mark. Uh, very impressive. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we will end the recording session. Mm -hmm.